The one thing on everybody's mind coming out of Monday Night Raw last night. The one thing on everybody's mind. You can look up and down on Twitter. You could even put JD from NY in the search on Twitter. And people are fucking crying. Begging, waiting for my reaction to last night. You see, when I see things like that on social media, when I know that people are awaiting a reaction from me, and this is a reaction that I've given people for the last, I don't know, four years? Four years? When those same people are still waiting and hanging on every word that comes out of my mouth as it pertains to Roman Reigns, you know that I'm doing something right, and you know that everything that I say is 100% factual. Everybody wanted to know, what did JD think of Roman Reigns' promo last night on Monday Night Raw? I want to let you guys know that I'm not grading it on good or bad. I'm not grading it in such a way because underneath the exterior of this promo cut by Roman Reigns last night was the same pathetic attempt by WWE, even worse last night than I have ever seen it done before in the last four years. WWE really thinks that we're fucking stupid. WWE and Vince McMahon and Kevin Dunn and all these fucking clowns in WWE management and in WWE creative, they must really think their adult audience is that fucking stupid to fall for such bullshit again in 2018. We're not eight years old, Vince. We're not going to be sitting at home. We're not going to be sitting in the arena praising Roman Reigns for his lame attempt at some fucking pipe bomb. This might have been the worst fucking pathetic attempt to get this guy over that I have ever fucking seen. Ever seen. And I don't want to raise my voice and I don't want to yell and I don't want to really come off in an angry manner. But everybody that is coming out on social media praising, great job, Roman. That was a hell of a promo. Roman cut the best promo of his life. Do you people not see what is going on here? Brock Lesnar advertised for Monday Night Raw at the Elimination Chamber. Advertised on Monday Night Raw at the start of the show. All of a sudden, when Roman comes out to cut his promo, Brock Lesnar's not there. Brock Lesnar mysteriously not in the arena. Brock Lesnar just walks out with no reason. So after two attempts of you advertising Brock Lesnar to be there to confront Roman Reigns, now all of a sudden Brock Lesnar's not there? Why? Did they give us a reason as to why he wasn't there? Of course they gave you a reason. WWE's reason was to send Roman out there in a pathetic attempt to get him over as the face going into WrestleMania while Brock Lesnar is portrayed as the heel. WWE had Roman go out there and cut Brock down in the same way that Roman cut John Cena down. Just... Last summer, right before No Mercy, John Cena doesn't care about the WWE. John Cena cares about Hollywood. John Cena is a part-timer. All he cares is about following in the footsteps of Dwayne Johnson. John Cena is old. John Cena is washed up. John Cena is stealing spotlight from all the younger talent in WWE. It's the same rhetoric. It's the same script. It's the same bullshit. That Roman tried to pull with John Cena. Now Roman is pulling it against Brock Lesnar in an attempt to make Brock Lesnar look bad. In an attempt to 
to just portray Brock Lesnar as him not caring about the WWE. We all know that he doesn't care about the WWE. Anyone watching this show knows that Brock Lesnar cares about one thing and one thing only. His time off and how much money he's making under a WWE contract. Roman comes out, says that Brock Lesnar was portrayed on social media in pictures on the Vegas Strip with Dana White. Brock Lesnar walked out of WWE because he doesn't care about the WWE. He doesn't care about the company. All he cares is about how much money he's making and what city he's going to be performing in. He doesn't give a shit about the fans. He doesn't give a shit about Monday Night Raw. He doesn't give a shit about the boys and girls in the locker room. He doesn't care about the company. Do you see what they're doing? Brock Lesnar is a respected athlete whether you like him or not. Brock Lesnar has gone into every match, every match he's been in, in the WWE, as an in-betweener. WWE is trying to portray him as a heel. WWE is trying to get Roman Reigns to tell the story that Brock Lesnar doesn't care about the WWE in an attempt that the fans turn against Brock Lesnar because he's doing the wrong thing and Roman's righteous and he's standing up for what's right and he's standing up for the company. Let me fucking go puke in the corner! What a fucking pathetic attempt to get this guy over as the babyface going into WrestleMania. Does WWE really think going into WrestleMania, which is the most smart mark fucking crowd anywhere, on any show, on any planet, does WWE really expect Roman to give me this fucking bullshit promo? And then expect to walk into WrestleMania as the babyface against Brock Lesnar on April 8th? Are you fucking kidding me? Roman is going to be booed out of the building no matter how righteous he is or not. Cut the fucking bullshit. Cut it. Give me a fucking break. Roman, oh, he cut a great promo. Oh, he cut such a great promo on Monday Night Raw. Yeah, he was by himself. He was by himself. What happened when John Cena was staring him eye to eye in the middle of the ring? Roman fucking choked. Roman choked like the Braves of the 90s. He fucking choked. He didn't know what to say. His mind was racing a thousand miles per hour. What do you think is going to happen when Brock Lesnar and Paul Heyman are both staring Roman Reigns eye to eye? You think Roman's going to cut a great promo like he did last night? He's going to choke again. And then when Paul Heyman comes out, and when Paul Heyman and Brock Lesnar are in the ring confronting Roman Reigns, you think Roman's going to be the one that's going to be cheered? You think Roman's going to be portrayed as the baby face? Cut the shit, WWE. Cut the shit. That Roman promo was nothing but straight fucking garbage in another pathetic attempt to get this guy over and shove him down our throats as the guy that's going to be coronated again as its world champion at WrestleMania. Fuck it being a good promo. Fuck it being Roman's best promo work to date. I don't even want to judge it on that. You need to look deeper. You need to look under the exterior of what that promo really was. I'm, I was fucking nauseous. It's laughable. It's laughable at how WWE is attempting to get this guy over. Again, I stress, I don't hate Roman Reigns the man. I hate the way WWE is portraying Roman Reigns in an attempt to get this guy over after failed attempt, failed attempt, Failed attempt. And now at WrestleMania 34, they're doing the same old tricks, expecting a different fucking result. This is the same verbiage and the same bullshit that they pulled with John Cena. It didn't work then. Now you're doing it against Brock Lesnar. It's not going to work now. Get it through your fucking skulls, people. Get it through your skulls. Brock Lesnar going into WrestleMania 34, whether you hate him, whether you love him, whether it's the last match of his WWE run right now before he really does go back to UFC. Brock Lesnar is walking into WrestleMania as the babyface of that match. And when Roman in inevitably wins the Universal Championship, it's going to be the same fucking shit that we've seen 
Year after year after year. Roman booed. He comes out on Monday Night Raw after WrestleMania. And the crowd absolutely wants this guy crucified in the middle of the ring live on the USA Network. I don't need to explain myself any further. You are all smart enough. If you're watching me, you are all smart enough to realize that whatever I said here is 100% factual. Moving on. And we got six more weeks of this fucking nauseous bullshit. Moving on. John Cena. John Cena and his WrestleMania spot. I want to let you guys know that I'm not the biggest John Cena advocate. I have actually warmed up to John Cena later on in his career. I think John Cena has put on some damn good matches. I think John Cena put on some of the best matches of his career later on in his run. John Cena's WrestleMania spot has been a storyline that I've been following very, very closely. I honestly think that WWE is booking John Cena brilliantly going into WrestleMania, and I mean that wholeheartedly. I'm enjoying this storyline. I'm enjoying the desperate John Cena. I'm enjoying the John Cena who feels like he's doing too much, you know? Going on to Hollywood and doing movies and going on promotions and NBC Today and, and, and The Tonight Show and all these different, you know, talk shows just promoting WWE and then flying to do Make-A-Wish and then doing Total Divas and Total Bellas and he's all over the place. The guy's like a fucking machine. He's like Terminator. John Cena feeling like he's doing too much in his outside life not being able to handle what's going on in the ring. And him making excuses as to why he's not getting the job done when prior he was always able to get the job done. John Cena coming out saying that, listen, I'm a man, I'm going to admit, I failed. I was a failure at the Elimination Chamber. John Cena came out and explained to everybody that he was a failure. John Cena's desperation to get to WrestleMania called out The Undertaker last night. He didn't win the Elimination Chamber. He wants to go to WrestleMania so badly, he called out The Undertaker last night on Monday Night Raw. And it was a damn good fucking promo. And I'm going to play it for you right now because the reaction from the crowd was unbelievable. The reaction from the crowd was unbelievable when he mentioned that he's calling out The Undertaker. Listen to this promo as John Cena addresses the dream match, and I use that term loosely by the way, which we'll discuss in a second. The dream match at WrestleMania 34 against The Undertaker. Last night, I failed. And in the moment of failure, and the atmosphere and the finality of it all, and the audience, I was immediately rushed into a room and thrown in front of a microphone, and I felt demoralized. Trust me, I know where I'm at and I've said it before. A person's character is not judged when they ride the wave of success. When everyone chants their name and you want to be their friend. No, your character is put to the test when your back is against the wall. And for me, that time is now. I spent five minutes last night feeling sorry for myself and then right after that I began to move forward my last words last night were I will figure it out and that is my road to Wrestlemania I thought it would be the Royal Rumble I failed I didn't give up I thought it would be the Elimination Chamber. I failed. And for five minutes, I thought it was over. And every single one of you can relate to this because this is what's difficult about failure. The disappointment is on you. It is your fault and you go through failure alone. But failure has made me who I am today. Failure gives you Two choices, you stay down or you get up. Well, I'm up and I am fired up because I have figured it out. I have figured out that I need to stand in this ring and just plain old do something that I should have done a long time ago.
and that is put out a WrestleMania challenge. is not happening. Oh, it is. I'll tell you exactly how it's going to happen, too. I don't make the matches. And as obvious as this seems, I've been told that that match is not happening because that match, once again, is impossible. You see, I told you, all of you understand. Now you all understand the disappointment of failure. And I can stay down or I can get my ass up and I'm in the getting up business. So I'm here tonight to say my road through WrestleMania goes straight through SmackDown. As a free agent, I will go to SmackDown Live tomorrow night not to beg, for some pity handout, no. It is to do whatever it takes to hopefully earn a spot at WrestleMania. See you tomorrow night. Well, John Cena is a free agent. A, I really enjoyed that promo. B, he name dropped The Undertaker with the reaction from the crowd. Meaning it's going to happen. It's going to happen. It's just, right now, John Cena going over to SmackDown as a free agent is kind of a detour that will lead him right back to where he mentioned The Undertaker tonight on Monday Night Raw. I'm enjoying this storyline, like I said before we played that promo, because I am enjoying desperate John Cena at the end of his career. Not saying he's going to retire anytime soon. I'm saying John Cena knows he's at the end of his career and he's trying to maintain that high level of success that we've all known from John Cena. We all know John Cena wants to be at WrestleMania in the main event. He wants to be the world champion. He still wants to be head and shoulders above everybody else, but he comes so close and and is realizing that maybe his time is up. Maybe his time is... Not so much a priority with the WWE anymore, but living his life, getting married, doing movies, stepping away from the WWE as a whole. He knows he can't compete with the younger guys who are quickly climbing the ranks, and John Cena is slowly declining down that ladder. I I, I love this storyline. I think this is great. And I think John Cena going over to SmackDown, yes... Yes, they are using John Cena as a way to bolster ratings on an otherwise dead SmackDown Live, because we all know SmackDown Live is complete garbage right now. Trash. SmackDown is the worst I've seen it since it became SmackDown Live, live on Tuesday nights. This is the absolute lowest of the low for SmackDown Live. But they're using John Cena on SmackDown Live to bolster ratings and get more eyes on that show. Yes, it's a cheap tactic. Yes, It goes to show you that WWE will use and continue to use John Cena to get ratings. Meanwhile, they're ignoring their younger talent and they're ignoring building up their younger talent to get them even close to a John Cena type level. We all know that. But WWE, right now, using the temporary band-aid that is going to peel off anyway of John Cena and probably The Undertaker on SmackDown Live. This is the good thing about John Cena being a free agent. He could be on Raw, he can be on SmackDown. Undertaker, as far as I know, is the same way. He could do whatever the fuck he wants. Already pled allegiance to SmackDown Live. Next thing you know, he's on Monday Night Raw. Who's to say The Undertaker can't show up on SmackDown Live and WWE can build this storyline and get this feud going on SmackDown Live to bolster some type of ratings increase on Tuesday nights? That's probably what they're going to do. But John Cena calling out The Undertaker was giving you guys a hint as to what we are going to get at WrestleMania. 
But what we're, what we're getting in the interim, what we're getting in the meantime on Tuesday night, tonight on SmackDown Live, John Cena is probably going to challenge Shinsuke Nakamura for his WWE Championship opportunity at WrestleMania. Now, why do I say that? Shinsuke Nakamura doesn't have an opponent at Fastlane. WWE is going to want to feature Shinsuke Nakamura at Fastlane. Right now, he has absolutely nothing to do until WrestleMania. In between, when he won the Royal Rumble and WrestleMania, Nakamura has nothing to do. Everybody that's in the main event is tied up in that fatal five-way. Randy Orton, Bobby Roode, and Jinder Mahal are all in the United States Championship title feud. There is nobody else on that roster that is A, worthy enough, or B, even makes sense to go up against Shinsuke Nakamura. And with WWE already having problems selling tickets to these single-branded pay-per-views, it only makes sense for John Cena to come out and challenge Shinsuke Nakamura at Fastlane with Nakamura's number one contendership for the WWE Championship on the line at WrestleMania. WWE, in the news, wants to make WrestleMania season and the road to WrestleMania unpredictable. Even though it is somewhat predictable. WWE thinks it's unpredictable. Putting someone like the caliber of John Cena in a match with Shinsuke Nakamura to all the young casuals out there, it could be perceived as unpredictable. Is John Cena going to beat Shinsuke Nakamura? Is John Cena going to challenge AJ Styles again for the WWE Championship at WrestleMania? That's what they're getting the young people to think. That's what they're getting the casuals to think. Meanwhile, us smarter fans know that WWE would be foolish to go against Nakamura versus AJ Styles. Nakamura doesn't have anything to do. Nakamura is a fighting guy. I don't see Nakamura turning down a challenge. I think Nakamura is man enough to believe that he could beat John Cena. He did it once. He'll, he'll do it again. Nakamura doesn't have an opponent. Cena's desperation is going to land him a match with Nakamura. We're going to get that at Fastlane. Nakamura is going to go on to win. Nakamura is going to go on to challenge whoever the champion is, preferably AJ Styles at WrestleMania. John Cena will then come out. Undertaker will then come out and say, listen, I heard you call my name. I heard you want a WrestleMania challenge. You want a road to WrestleMania. Get in, the get in the back of my hearse, and let's ride on into WrestleMania in New Orleans. Probably going to be a career versus career situation for John Cena and The Undertaker. And this is where I don't agree with people online. Yes, it is a big money match. Yes, you need to have the match at WrestleMania because you're leaving a lot of money on the table if you are not featuring that match at WrestleMania. Being that The Undertaker doesn't have much time at all left as a professional wrestler. You need to do this now, you need to do this this year, or it's not going to happen at all. Money will be left on the table, yes. But it's very difficult for a fan of this company to invest their time into this feud now in 2018 when we all know the biggest money and the largest amount of money that WWE could have made with these two was back at WrestleMania 30 with the streak intact. WWE opted to give it to Brock Lesnar because he was the most realistic option to beat The Undertaker at WrestleMania 30. But what if we could turn back time and John Cena was the one in that stage of his career, big money John, everybody at the edge of their seat, is John Cena, the most hated man in wrestling, going to conquer the streak at WrestleMania 30? AAs and STFs and everything that John Cena is known to be hated for against The Undertaker. People would have been left with no fingernails, sweat like fucking Shaq at the foul line, edge of your seat fucking action. With John Cena and The Undertaker at WrestleMania 30 with the streak on the line. You know? John Cena mentioned they got 39 WrestleManias between the two of them. 39 WrestleManias, people. But it's four WrestleManias too late. It's four WrestleManias too late for me to care about anything with The Undertaker and John Cena. And pardon me. Excuse me if I'm not excited to see two First ballot Hall of Famers, two of the best ever in the ring at WrestleMania. Excuse me if I'm not interested in seeing that. A, 
Do you remember what The Undertaker did at WrestleMania last year against Roman Reigns? Some people are telling me Undertaker has on and off, se- or on and off seasons, on and off years. One year he's on, one year he's off. I don't want to see The Undertaker in the ring after what I've seen last year. The guy could barely fucking move. Did you guys watch that WrestleMania 24 special from Orlando last year on the WWE Network? Did you see the way The Undertaker was moving in the back before he came out to do his entrance at WrestleMania? Did you see the way he was walking after the match was over, after he descended into the fucking stage? It's not The Undertaker I want to see in the ring against John Cena. And Roman Reigns is no ring general. Neither is John Cena. And The Undertaker is at a stage in his career battered by injuries where he's not even going to be a ring general like we know he could be 15 years ago. So excuse me if I don't want to see a a battered Undertaker with two bad hips against John Cena who can't lead in a professional wrestling match. Case in point, just go back and watch his match with Roman Reigns. Awful. Four years too late for The Undertaker and John Cena. And the biggest thing of all, If this is really a career versus a career match, you're going to have The Undertaker lose at WrestleMania again. And after last year's send-off, what could WWE even fucking contemplate doing for The Undertaker this year after what they did last year? You're going to do that same thing again to close this year's WrestleMania? What the fuck was that shit about? It's only going to make me think they did it for Roman. Roman beats The Undertaker and we get this beautiful send-off. Everybody's fucking crying. If they do the same thing again this year and actually The Undertaker physically 100% retires this year because he lost to John Cena, what is it going to make you think about last year? All the visuals and all the tears and everything just to add to Roman's resume, the Roman Reigns effect affecting The Undertaker at WrestleMania 33 last year. Roman leaving kids heartbroken because he finished The Undertaker at WrestleMania. Come on. Come on, man. Other than that, I'm enjoying this situation with John Cena. I'm very much looking forward to what he has to say on SmackDown Live. After what we're seeing on SmackDown Live, John Cena right now is a breath of fresh air tonight for the show on Tuesday night. Moving on with whatever else I had a problem with on Monday Night Raw. Another six-woman tag. Another six-woman tag here on Monday Night Raw because WWE Creative is fucking lazy. Alexa Bliss won the first ever Women's Elimination Chamber match. So she comes out to start the show and she gloats and she boasts about winning the Elimination Chamber and retaining her Raw Women's Championship. You have no idea how amazing it feels to know that I retained my Raw Women's Championship by winning the historic first ever Women's Elimination Chamber match. Not only did I defy the odds, but I set the new standard to what it means to be Raw Women's Champion. The WWE Universe is going to be talking about me and my victories for the next 10, 20, 50 years from now. One day. No, they're not. Nobody's going to be even talking about the Elimination Chamber match that you win in fucking two weeks from now. The day Alexa Bliss changed the game, then, now, and forever. She didn't change no game, people. I love me some Alexa Bliss, but. WWE now, is incredibly it high came down to Sasha for and undeserved I had two of wrestling us in the elimination chamber but I just capitalized on her worst characteristic her massive ego Sorry boss this just isn't your year Once I came to Monday Night Raw it became my year which is why I'm going to Points to the sign WrestleMania I've always wanted to do that. <laughs> yeah, the little point. I've always wanted to do that. It feels good. And she's got Mickey James next to her. During this entire promo, she's got Mickey James next to her. Can someone please tell me when Mickey James underwent a fucking heel turn? When did this come about? Was this explained? Is WWE supposed to, you know, just pretend like Mickey James wasn't a babyface like two weeks ago? Why am I going to sit here and believe that Mickey James all of a sudden is a heel? There's no explanation to any of this. Yet WWE thinks that we're all fucking stupid. This is why the women's division sucks. There's no explanation for anything. Anything at all. 
Why is Mickey James standing next to Alexa Bliss when she was the one challenging for the Women's Championship not that long ago? With no explanation. It feels good, but you know, that doesn't even compare to the feeling I'm gonna feel six weeks from now at WrestleMania when I break Asuka's streak. Now, WWE is pretending, WWE is pretending that we're going to get, and I, and I say pretending because I honestly don't think that WWE is going to give us Alexa Bliss versus Asuka at WrestleMania, and, and for one very good reason, which I'll explain after the promo is over, but I, I don't think that Alexa is going to be challenging Asuka. It's just wish, I, I, I just wish WWE didn't mention it at all yet. And this is the reason why these, you know, the, these pay-per-views in between the Rumble and WrestleMania are, are fucking pointless. The Elimination Chamber, I can understand. But Fastlane is something that doesn't need to happen. And Fastlane is, uh, is a direct reason as to why this women's title situation right now is A, confusing, and B, illogical. It's all because of what's happening on Fastlane that they haven't given you a set match for WrestleMania yet. And I'll get to that in a second. Okay. Speaking of break, I hope Asuka's 100% by the time WrestleMania rolls around because you know Nia Jax left the Empress of Tomorrow in a pile of wreckage. <laughs> And I know Nia would love to get her hands on Asuka once again, but Asuka's gonna regret her victory from last night because at WrestleMania, I cannot wait to finish the job. Not so fast. And apparently, Asuka can't wait. You know what I find really funny, Asuka? That you just boldly prance out here like you're 100% healthy. Because last night, Nia humiliated and crushed you. Nia Jax deserves to be in that championship match, and you know it. Oh, you want clarification? Fine. Asuka, I know your English is not great, but your oh, body up. language is saying very differently. Oscar's like, yeah, yeah, I'm you know, gonna maybe kick your you fucking wipe uh, that eyelashes off. off. Your face before she does. Gonna kick the makeup right off your fucking face that's pounded on there. Oh, oh no! What is this? What is this shit? The irresistible force. By the goddess. Are you fucking kidding me? What is so irresistible about Nia Jax? Please, someone explain this to me. Really? And Oscar oh. striking first. And now Nia Jax just bulldozing through Oscar. There's no way Asuka's 100% after being so put So the Nia the Jax is destroying night. Asuka, and then Sasha Alexa Banks and Bayley come this. down, and look at this they try and save Asuka. Look at Asuka. Asuka a triangle lock Mickey in. James and Alexa Bliss now come in, triple yeah, team. That, Asuka Mickey a heel, again, no explanation as to why Mickey she's helping and Alexa Bliss and Nia Jax all of a sudden. Here comes Alexa Bayley and Sasha. Bayley. Sasha Banks looking to settle the score as well. But don't forget oh. about Nia. Well, Oscar once again. And this all led to a triple threat, Ma uh, not a triple threat, uh, a six-man tag kicks to open the show. Bliss turns her attention with a big right hand. Wow. So that, that's the way Monday Night Raw opened, but the reason why WWE hasn't really, uh, I, I would say, given... Asuka, a, a chance to choose her own opponent for WrestleMania it is directly involved with Charlotte and Ruby Riot. You see, if Asuka comes out and challenges and, and challenges and name drops Charlotte, I challenge Charlotte for the SmackDown Live Women's Championship, it pretty much renders the Women's Championship at Fastlane between Charlotte and Ruby Riot very predictable. It's as if the match shouldn't even be taking place. So, in my state of mind, I hope that WWE is keeping Nia Jax involved here so that she is the one to get the match against Alexa Bliss and that when Charlotte wins at Fastlane, 
Then we get Asuka challenging. No, I'm not going to be challenging Alexa Bliss. I beat you already. Nia is going to have that 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 uh, that obligation at WrestleMania, and Nia is going to be the one to to challenge you at WrestleMania. I'm going on to fight Charlotte, and I hope that is the case because a that's the WrestleMania match we all want. Those are two of the best females in the company right now, and that is a WrestleMania match. B Asuka moving over to SmackDown makes sense logistically because with Ronda Rousey now being full-time on Monday Night Raw, you want to keep them separated for the time being. You want Ronda to gain her own momentum, and you want Asuka to be, obviously, continued building up her streak on SmackDown Live and running through everybody on SmackDown Live Live for an eventual face-to-face when Asuka is undefeated against the undefeated Ronda Rousey. So, that could be... Uh, a, a big situation there and a determining factor that Asuka is going to go over to SmackDown Live and challenge SmackDown Live, uh, sh- you know, for the Women's Championship over there with Charlotte. Other than that, Nia Jax being involved right now, WWE booked Nia Jax versus Asuka next week on Monday Night Raw again. Please, kill me. I know. But we all kind of predicted that maybe Alexa was going to get involved during their match at the Elimination Chamber. I could now see... Alexa Bliss getting involved, trying to cost Asuka the match, but having uh, a situation where she fucks over Nia next week and costs Nia the match on Monday Night Raw. So I don't know what's going to happen with that, but I I think Ruby Riot and Charlotte, the fact that WWE hasn't given Asuka the opportunity to challenge Charlotte for the SmackDown Live Women's Champion or or hasn't given Asuka a chance to name drop Charlotte as a, as a way for her to challenge Charlotte for the Women's Championship at WrestleMania is, is directly involved with Ruby Riot because that would pretty much render that match obsolete, no pun intended, and that would pretty much make it a predictable outcome. Well, if Oscar's challenging Charlotte, then Ruby Riot really stands no chance, and nobody expects Ruby Riot versus Oscar at WrestleMania. I mean, you can't be that fucking stupid. So that's my thought on that. Other than that, the six women bullshit. The six women tags have got to go. I mean, it's just lazy fucking creative writing. How many fucking weeks? We're on the road to WrestleMania. Can we get something that really just depicts these women as competitors vying for the most important thing in the, in the division, and that is the women's championship? What is with the six-woman tags? You don't have it. This is, this is the problem with not having enough women on the show. You got six women, and WWE feels like they have to feature everybody. If there was if there was more women in this division that were that were being utilized, we wouldn't be getting six women tags and we wouldn't have WWE feeling that they have to feature everybody on a three hour show. Not everybody has to be featured every week. That's the fucking problem here. If you have more women in the division, you got more fresh matchups and less six woman tags happening. Same thing with the fucking Miz. Same, same thing with The Miz and the Intercontinental Championship. We're going to go over that next, because that's another thing that fucking bothered me. The Miz coming out on Monday Night Raw, proclaiming that he's the greatest Intercontinental Champion of all time. So he cuts a promo on Raw last night, going off on Kurt Angle, how he feels Kurt Angle is holding not only the Intercontinental Champion down, but he's holding The Miz down as well. Kurt Angle takes his stars for granted. Understand, in 62 days, I will become the longest reigning Intercontinental Champion of all time. And as big of a star as I am in this ring, I'm even bigger out there. My shine... The I longest reigning Intercontinental Champion of all time. So WWE now is just piecing franchise. days together and, and pretending like The Miz has held the Intercontinental Championship longer than anybody. Give me a fucking Maurice break, will you? On the new television sensation, Miz and Mrs. I will say that again and you will cheer. The new television sensation, Miz and Mrs. Those booing, you'll be watching it anyway, so I don't care. (laughs) All these accolades, and I'm still treated like any other superstar. 
Hell, I'm treated worse. I don't even have merchandise. Go up there. Look for my merchandise. Look for my t-shirts. Look for anything. Look at the promotional pictures that WWE puts out. This face, this face, better looking than all of them, by the way. This face isn't on any of them. I should be going to the main event of WrestleMania. No, you shouldn't. No, he shouldn't. He isn't that good, and he was never that good. But yet, Kurt Angle forced me to start the Elimination Chamber match with two men who shouldn't have been there in the first place. Kurt Angle handed Finn Balor and Seth Rollins, he handed them an opportunity that they didn't deserve, yet I was punished for winning my qualification match with ease. I am sick of being taken for granted. I am sick of the disrespect. So the fact that the fact that John Cena challenged the Miz, I don't see how, how they over overseen that. Like he didn't even mention that. Again, it's like WWE wants you to forget for the sake of whatever story they're telling now. John Cena challenged the Miz for the spot in the Elimination Chamber. If 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 the Miz loses, he's number one. They they just completely overshot that. It's as if the Miz intentionally forgot to mention that because the Miz took the challenge that John Cena laid forth. So he's complaining about being the number one man in the chamber with Finn Balor and Seth Rollins, but willingly took the match against John Cena when he could have easily said no. Am I fucking losing my mind? Or am I just really paying attention to what I'm watching on TV? This is your problem, people. You need to pay attention week to week to week, not only on what you deem positive, but everything that they do, they try and turn it into a positive or try to have it come off as positive, but they don't make any sense. Week to week to week, there's more negative about these shows than you realize. That's why I'm here. That's why you're watching me right now, wherever you may be. And I don't care what happens to all the participants in the Elimination Chamber. I know that my dream will live on at WrestleMania because I have this. And I want you all to take a really good look at this. This is the most prestigious and honorable title in all of WWE. All because he says it is does not mean it is. The Miz, again, this promo, again, proves me right in everything I said about The Miz. The Miz didn't have a breakout year in 2017. He did not. He did not. He didn't bring prestige back to the title. He didn't make the title more important than it was previously. He didn't do any of that for the Intercontinental title. The Intercontinental title was neither here or there. The Miz had a breakout year as far as a man on the microphone. The Miz is a breakout star as a promo. As for what he does in the ring and what he does for the Intercontinental title, absolutely no way. There's no way you can compare, and I say this all the time, there's no way you can compare what The Miz did in 2017 to the tail end of 2016. If this was The Miz going against Dolph Ziggler for the Intercontinental Championship and what he did for that title with, with Ziggler at the end of 2016, then yes, whatever he's saying here would hold a lot more weight than it does this year. But it doesn't. It doesn't. The Miz right now, whatever he's talking about, I don't see where, where they're going with this, and I don't see why people, so many people are on board with, oh, The Miz has done so great with the Intercontinental Championship. What the fuck has he done? What has he done? In my eyes, The Miz, and I don't want to compare him to, to this guy because this other guy is complete fucking garbage, but The Miz is just as bad as Jinder Mahal. Every match is the same fucking outcome. Every match is the same thing. He's always got outside help. Oh, but JD, he, he's the heel. If The Miz was such a great intercontinental champion, then he wouldn't need the help 
every single time to get the job done. And I'm going to, again, I'm going to reinforce that fact in just a little bit. Because what happened to The Miz tonight and what he stated are complete polar opposites. And since I have this title, this prestigious title, I walk into Kurt Angle's office. I say, Kurt, I want to know what the Intercontinental Champion is doing at WrestleMania. Kurt Angle says this, Miz, your opponent tonight might determine who you face at WrestleMania. I know, I said the same thing. Might, might. I have carried Monday Night Raw for the past year on my back. No, you have. I have made this title more relevant than the Universal Championship. No, you have. And you're gonna tell me, me, might, might. I am the Miz. I have been here for 12 years. And might is all you're going to give me? Well, understand, whoever comes out is going to get a beating. And I don't care who it is. So who is it? Oh, man. I like that. So Rollins comes out, and he has a match with The Miz. Now, The Miz went on to say that he is better than Shawn Michaels, Bret Hart, Pedro Morales, Edge, Chris Jericho, and I don't even know why he put him in the discussion for greatest intercontinental champions of all time because this is just WWE political garbage when it comes to him, Roman Reigns. The Miz is nowhere in any of those men's leagues at all. So A, it's criminal to even compare The Miz to any of those guys. B, He's such a great Intercontinental Champion, right? He's carried the brand of Monday Night Raw on his back. He's made the Intercontinental Championship so prestigious. So WWE books The Miz in not one, but two matches. And they book him in two matches against Rollins and Balor, and he loses both matches. So how great of an Intercontinental Champion is he? Not very good if he's losing to two guys. Clearly, he is inferior to these men. And clearly shouldn't be carrying the Intercontinental Championship. That's what that tells me. So your Intercontinental Champion wants to know what he's doing at WrestleMania. So the Miz, books, uh, the Miz is booked in two matches on Monday Night Raw, and he loses to, the, to two of the best wrestlers on the brand. Some Intercontinental Champion you got there, WWE. Great way to portray your Intercontinental Champion. Another thing I had a problem with here is the lack of mid-card and the lack of direction for WWE. We all thought that WWE was going to announce the Intercontinental Championship match for WrestleMania with really no build-up. Just put The Miz against a random opponent. Has Rollins deserved anything as far as an Intercontinental Championship goes? And I'm not talking about his performance. Yes, based on his performance, the guy is deserved the world. But he just left a tag team situation in which he was vying for the tag team titles. He lobbied to get in the Elimination Chamber for the WWE Championship. Now all of a sudden he's being put in the Intercontinental Championship without working his way up? I, I don't understand that. I, I really don't get how you go from tag team to, to universal to intercontinental. There's, there's no, you know, it, it's like these guys do nothing to earn opportunities. There's no hard work that goes into earning a title opportunity anymore. Like what have you done to earn an intercontinental title match? Nothing. Same thing with Finn Balor. What has he done to earn an Intercontinental Championship match? At least give me matches and a competitive mid-card to where we can determine who is the best opponent for The Miz instead of just randomly picking guys and randomly having your fucking champion lose two times in one night. No mid-card. No mid-card anywhere. On either of these brands. Yeah, people think it's all hunky-dory on fucking Monday and Tuesday nights. Give me a fucking break. Now, the one positive thing I, I, I found out all this is that the rumored Miz versus Braun Strowman match is not happening at WrestleMania as far as what we see here. We all wondered what was going to happen with Seth Rollins. 
Was WWE even going to contemplate putting him in the Lesnar-Reigns match? Clearly no. Clearly no. Rollins made it known that he wants the Intercontinental Championship at WrestleMania. Finn Balor? There's no better way for Finn Balor, Finn Balor to be utilized at WrestleMania than to put him in the Intercontinental Championship. That was my desired first match. Balor versus The Miz. Now you got Rollins in there. It's a triple threat match. We all thought Rollins maybe could have been added to the Universal Championship. Maybe Rollins versus Kurt Angle. Maybe Rollins versus uh, Triple H and Stephanie McMahon teaming with Ronda Rousey. You know? It was Rollins versus Ambrose. Rollins versus Jordan. Rollins all over the place. Now they finally got a home for him at WrestleMania. I'm not going to complain about it because The Miz versus Balor versus Rollins is a very, very good match for WrestleMania. These three were in a main event on Monday Night Raw last May, which was probably the best main event on Monday Night Raw all of last year. So I am not going to have a problem with seeing these three do it again at WrestleMania. I hope that they can capture that same excitement at WrestleMania and give me an even better match than we've seen last year on Monday Night Raw. So I am happy about that. I am happy that they found Rollins and Balor a spot at WrestleMania. I'm glad that the Intercontinental Championship is going to be defended at WrestleMania, finally, in a prominent way, you know? Or maybe The Miz loses it before WrestleMania. We don't even know, you know? WWE right now, you, you could really think of it this way. They're making it a triple threat match just in case because Maurice is actually due to have her child two days before WrestleMania. I know The Miz won't miss WrestleMania. I don't think the, uh, you know Maurice would want The Miz to miss WrestleMania, but there is always a possibility that the baby doesn't come out on time. And The Miz might have to miss WrestleMania because he doesn't want to miss the birth of his first child. So maybe WWE is making this triple threat match, A, not because it makes sense, not because it's the best option for all three guys, but maybe it's a precautionary reason because of the due date for Maurice to have the kid. Just throwing that out there. Just throwing that out there. But yes, The Miz did lose twice in one night. Some great intercontinental champion we have on Monday Night Raw. Ronda Rousey. Ronda Rousey comes out and an explanation is needed as to why Stephanie McMahon slapped Ronda Rousey on the Elimination Chamber pay-per-view. Why Ronda Rousey threw Triple H through the contract table and just broke the table in half, belly-to-belly suplexing him through the table. And I'm going to play the promo, even though it's probably going to make my ears bleed. Ronda Rousey demands an apology from Stephanie McMahon for the actions displayed at the Elimination Chamber. Ronda oh. acted out of savage instinct. Blah, 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 blah. Shut up, Stephanie. Okay, you make my ears bleed. Understand I can't that, stand you. I don't have a remote control, her, otherwise I, I shut the TV her. off. I had to speak her language. I had to get physical with Ronda Rousey to remind her of the hierarchy Let me show you here did. in WWE. Let me show you that. You got real physical. Because I am the commissioner of Monday Night Raw, which means... Kurt Angle reports to me, which means as of last night, since Ronda Rousey did amongst the chaos sign her WWE contract, Ronda now reports to me, which means WWE owns Ronda Rousey. So now, as a, See, as a good we all manager, was gonna go as a there. good she, she boss, owns I just need to call Ronda everybody now. out here explain their specific roles and responsibilities so everyone knows their place and we can move forward on the road to WrestleMania. Yeah! And it all starts with an apology from Kurt Angle. So, Kurt, You should be apologizing to the fucking fans who watch this show every week for the fucking utter shit that we have to sit through. I don't want to get copyrighted right here. Kurt Angle comes down. Listen, Ronda. Ronda made a beeline for the ring. I charging to the ring. Thing. She wanted to beat the shit out of Stephanie. You coming to the WWE is the best decision you ever made. Kurt. I meant everything that I said last night. I want this more than anything but I have never been slapped before in my life. I refuse to be disrespected. And I am no one's property. 
Now this is a completely different world than you're accustomed to. You need to work within the system. And Rhonda, honestly, I lied. I lied. No, he didn't. No, he didn't. Remember at the Elimination Chamber, Kurt Angle stated that they, uh, or that he overheard Stephanie and Triple H talking about, oh, we can't wait to sign Ronda Rousey. This is three years in the making. We own the bitch now. Or, you know, he overheard Stephanie McMahon and Triple H talking, saying that, you know, didn't you call Ronda Rousey uh, a has-been and washed up and that you could take Ronda Rousey? You know, that you could beat the shit out of Ronda Rousey? So Kurt Angle on, on the Elimination Chamber Sunday night said all these things because he had pneumonia or he had like double pneumonia or the flu or some type of sickness that made him delirious and delusional, right? But he overheard these things being said. Now on Monday night, he's coming out and stating that he lied. He lied. Either Kurt Angle is really fucking delirious and he's channeling his inner Mike Adamly spirit or Stephanie McMahon at Triple H forced him to say that he lied to Ronda just so that he could save his job. Because what Kurt Angle says next, he mentions that he needs this job. I don't know why I lied. I misheard Stephanie and Triple H talking about you, and I've had pneumonia for the past couple weeks. I don't even know what I said last night. But those statements I made, they weren't true. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Thank you, Kurt, for finally clearing the air. I mean, Rhonda, we're not horrible people. In spite of what you might read on social media or hear in these arenas. I mean, and we understand why you did what you did. And, and now you understand that Kurt was lying. Thank you, Kurt, for apologizing. So. Let's just put this all behind us and make you the superstar that you deserve to be. This is all, I, I could see this easily being a way for Triple H and Stephanie to blackmail Kurt Angle with his job just so that she can get revenge on Ronda for what Ronda did at WrestleMania 21, or 31 rather. You know, I could see them doing something like that where Kurt's job is in jeopardy if he doesn't pay attention to Stephanie or doesn't abide by Stephanie and Triple H just so that they can get in and make Ronda's life a living hell because Stephanie is a conniving evil bitch, a bitter bitch who wants to just get back at Ronda for what she did to her. I could see that. But then the punch at the end makes no sense. Hey. It kind of goes back on everything I just mentioned. Triple H and Stephanie, thank you, thank you, thank you. Walking out of the ring. You know, we have addressed everything. Except your slap. If you want to put all of this behind us, you need to apologize to me. And if you don't apologize, I will not hesitate to rip your arm out of its socket. I am terribly sorry. Oh my God, please. I am so terribly God, sorry. God, it's so Ronda. cringe. I'm so sorry. You put my husband through a table. Mm, I, I can't just, listen to it, It was it, the man. wrong thing to do. There's no excuse. God, she's I'm just I'm so awful. sorry. Her character is I'm just so awful, sorry. Dude. Please believe me, I'm sorry. Kurt, thank you. How are they gonna, how are they gonna revisit the well, Austin McMahon storyline with Rhonda and Stephanie here, man? Thank Stephanie you. is no yes, Vince. Yes, we're good. Okay, all good now. One thing I did mention on the Elimination Chamber review, Rhonda, no more smiling. She didn't smile tonight. Very direct, very, um, very minimal in what she said, and it worked. I think Rhonda played great. I think she cut a very good promo, and I expect her to get better. Do I eventually want to see her with Paul Heyman? Yes, I do. But Rhonda tonight... Very much held her own, and she got rid of the smiling that I didn't like at the Elimination Chamber. Very, very keyed in on what happened last night, and was very serious when it came to Stephanie McMahon. Good shit. Oh, oh my God! What the? 
Maybe Triple H, Triple H just nailed Kurt Angle. Maybe Triple H, maybe Triple H and Stephanie didn't even talk to Kurt Angle or have him blackmailed. Maybe Kurt Angle is going into business for himself because he doesn't agree with what they did to Ronda or what their plans are against Ronda. Maybe he does have some inside information. He came out on his own and said that he lied just to save his own ass. Triple H kind of sees right through him right now. Like, Kurt, I know what you're doing. I I see right through you. And and Triple H took it upon himself to say, you know what, Kurt, go fuck yourself. But it looks like it is really going to be Kurt Angle and Ronda Rousey versus Triple H and Stephanie McMahon at WrestleMania. It's just the punch that threw everything off there. And that's the one thing, the one piece of information that we're going to have to carry on into next week. Why did Triple H punch Kurt Angle for no reason? So, those are the situations that I'm thinking of right now. Let me know what you guys think about that down below. What was that for? Nobody knows. Nobody knows what's going on there. Those are the big stories coming out of Monday Night Raw, man. Everything else that happened on this show, there was the the six-woman tag... Uh, Oscar Bailey and Sasha Banks versus Alexa Bliss, Mickey James, and Nia Jax. Uh, the one thing that happened in the end of that match was Bailey. Bailey, Bailey, Bailey. She went for a tag. Sasha Banks did, and Bailey jumped off the apron. So Bailey getting Sasha Banks back for what Sasha Banks did to her at the Elimination Chamber, man. The intertwining story here between Bailey and Sasha Banks, I don't know when that's going to play out because right now I don't see a role for Sasha Banks or Bailey at WrestleMania. And I will focus on that as we get on in the six weeks. I do not think that WWE needs to put everybody on the Mania card. Focus on what is most important. You don't need to fill the Mania card with 18 fucking matches making it a uh, 12-hour pay-per-view. Give me quality over quantity this year, please, please, but Bailey jumped off the apron as Sasha Banks went for the tag just to get, kind of get her back, you know, Bailey's not turning heel, it's just Bailey finally growing a pair of balls, not literally, and standing up for herself, good for her, Oscar Bailey and Sasha Banks win, and uh, that was that, after the match, Bailey looks on from ringside, stares over at Banks, um, and that was pretty much it. We had Bray Wyatt versus Heath Slater. This one was was self-explanatory. Uh, Matt Hardy comes out, and or it doesn't come out, but he, he stated after Bray Wyatt uh, sits down in the corner, he says, Hardy made me do this, man. He, you, you made me hurt these innocent men, man. Wyatt says the great war is far from over, and, and Matt Hardy, you will face me again, man, after I get done with JoJo's jiggly fat ass, man. Time. I will make time for you, Matt Hardy, and your woken eyes will stay shut forever, man. But my eyes are wide open when JoJo's jiggly fat ass walks into the room, man. And then he starts laughing. Says he's coming for Matt. Matt says that... He will fight Bray Wyatt on his own time in his own place. Meaning that we're probably going to get a final deletion-esque match. Uh, I don't know if they'll do it at Raw or if WWE deems this WrestleMania worthy. I I mentioned at the Elimination Chamber review that I I think this feud has run its course. And I honestly don't think Matt Hardy is to blame. I think Matt Hardy has gotten the short end of the stick because Bray Wyatt was such a dead character and there really is nothing else for these two guys to do. The promo work started off exciting, and then it fizzled out. Just like everything else with Bray Wyatt fizzles out. The feud with Finn Balor was fucking dead and overdone, and nobody cared. The fact that the mumps, or whatever disease was filling the WWE locker room, was probably a blessing in disguise for Bray Wyatt, because it saved him from dressing up in drag at TLC. Now we got Matt Hardy in a feud with Bray Wyatt, and Bray Wyatt has done nothing of importance during this entire feud. Nothing memorable in this feud with, with Matt Hardy. It's seemingly dead. Just end it already. Just end it. Bray Wyatt is a dead character. This is why I mentioned Bray Wyatt needs to be thrown into the lake of reincarnation if they're visiting the Hardy compound because Bray Wyatt fucking needs to be resurrected into a different fucking character. Bray Wyatt either needs to go darker, we need to see a Sister Abigail-type character to WWE television, You took Bray Wyatt from the Wyatt family in which he was a leader. 
a cult leader, and now he's just floundering on his own. Sister Abigail needs to be reintroduced to the WWE Universe as a legit character to his act. He needs to go darker. Something needs to be done about this guy. Because right now, you might as well just fucking not even feature Bray Wyatt on television. Nobody cares. Nobody believes anything he says. And every time he's in the ring, it's an L, an L, an L. Pin after pin after pin. But we don't know if we're going to see the final deletion-esque match at WrestleMania or on a random edition of Monday Night Raw. I'm hoping they do it at WrestleMania in the same vein that they did Goldust versus Roddy Piper many, many years ago. So we'll see what happens with that. But he will fight uh, Bray Wyatt on his own terms in his own place. Rollins versus The Miz. Rollins kicked out. Uh, Rollins uh, not kicked out. Uh, the Miz did not kick out. Huge frog splash from Seth Rollins. Beautiful fucking move. Almost all the way across the ring, man. More than, Well, more than halfway across the ring. Beautiful frog splash for the win. Uh, the Miz, right after that, uh, fought Finn Balor. The Miz Taraj tried to get this match uh, not to happen because they sneak attack Balor as he hit the ring, so it was three on one. Kurt Angle comes onto the screen and throws the Miz Taraj out of ringside, bans them from ringside. This all leads to Balor uh, doing the typical stuff. You got the sling blade, the hesitation drop kick in the corner, coup de gras. Covers Miz for the win, so the Miz loses to uh, Finn Balor and Seth Rollins in the same evening. Two out of three falls for the Raw Tag Team Championships. This is the fourth time. You see how terrible the Raw Tag Team division is right now, right? The fact that the Bar versus Titus Worldwide happened four straight weeks. Four straight weeks. Yet WWE wants to tout, oh, the competition in the Tag Team division on Monday Night Raw is outstanding. What competition? Are you serious? Yeah, some competition that you feature in no other tag teams on the show, but featuring a tag team title feud with the same two teams four weeks in a row. And a team in Titus Worldwide that nobody gives a shit about. By the way, they, they have a knack for making uh, a reference to Dana's statistics. I'm going to do the same thing on Monday Night Raw. Dana Brooke, wearing the same outfit she wore at the Elimination Chamber, looked like she didn't even clean her fucking laundry, looked like she slept in some fucking hotel room with Apollo Crews, Right? She didn't even change her clothing. God knows if she took a fucking shower the next morning. Dana Brooke, the statistics, the, the, the statistics of Dana Brooke for this week's Monday Night Raw review. What is she writing down in that little notepad she's got? Well, according to my sources, the sodium levels in Titus's chicken gumbo that was served in catering were much higher than the lentil soup was served last week. What statistics are going to be presented from Dana Brooks' notepad next week on Monday Night Raw Review? Find out. Find out. Two out of three falls match. The first fall happened almost in 30 seconds. Big bro kick to Titus. There you go. The bar up one nothing. Titus then, watching Apollo get beat down, finally gets the hot tag, unloads, no homo, on Sheamus. Near falls back and forth between the two teams. Clash of the Titus. Finish she say, uh, Sheamus, take out Titus on the floor, throwing him into the barrier. The bar hits that double team white noise on Apollo, covers Apollo for the winning fall. Can we not see Titus worldwide, Titus catering worldwide in a tag team title feud now? Finally, please, just get them out of there. Get them off television. They're garbage. After the match, Charlie Caruso interviews the bar in the ring. They joke about having Titus worldwide's number, zero. They also run down some of the other tag teams on Monday Night What other tag teams? What other tag teams are there? There are nobody but the Revival, and they're even dead. Going to be a lot of work to get people to care about the Revival after two debilitating injuries to both Wilder and Dawson. We got um, Sheamus bringing up WrestleMania 34 and how dominant they are, wondering who is left to face when there's no one left for them to beat. Well, you want to know why there's no one left to beat Sheamus? Because there's nobody else on the roster. Elias is in the ring. Playing his guitar. Braun Strowman criticized his music. And Elias versus Braun Strowman here. I mean, this was, why is this even happening? Now, there you go. The downfall of Braun Strowman begins again after losing to Roman Reigns in the Elimination Chamber after eliminating five of the guys on his own, speared by Roman Reigns. Now he's got a, a match with Elias. What is Braun Strowman doing at WrestleMania? That's my question. That's my question. Do they add him to the Universal Championship match now that Rollins is added to uh, Balor and The Miz and the IC title? Or do they put him in the Andre the Giant Memorial Battle Royal? Braun launches Elias into the barrier. 
Braun brings Elias back into the ring. Elias rolls away. Elias goes underneath the ring, takes out a fire extinguisher, sprays Braun Strowman in the face with the, with the fire extinguisher. He gets himself disqualified. Braun Strowman wins by DQ. After the bell, Elias continues to spray um, the fire extinguisher on Braun Strowman. Um, Elias then realizes that Braun Strowman is unaffected by this. He chases Elias up the ramp. Elias is running away. Braun drags Elias over and goes to put him through the announce table once again. And he tried to power slam him, but Elias rakes his eyes, slides out of the way, and runs to the back. Runs to the backstage area. Elias runs away, and Braun isn't happy about losing to him. And all of a sudden, he can't find Elias. So a limousine pulls up as Braun was running to the backstage area, and we go to commercial break. What, what the fuck was that about? What, what was that about? A limousine pulls up with Braun Strowman screaming, I'm not finished with you for Elias. And a limousine pulls up with Braun Strowman fucking wiping his eyes from the fire extinguisher and he's just standing there. Was that Braun Strowman's Uber? Did Braun Strowman order a limousine Uber? I don't, what the fuck was that? We didn't see anybody come out of the limousine. We don't know why the limousine was there. What a weird spot. I can only assume that was Stephanie and Triple H, but who the fuck knows with this company? And that was pretty much it. Ronda Rousey and her wanting an apology from Stephanie McMahon closed the show. Uh, that's everything that happened on Monday Night Raw, man. I, I went over everything that, that I could in the best way that I could. Um, I slept on everything for a little bit, got my notes ready last night, recorded this morning. So hopefully you guys enjoyed my take on Monday Night Raw. And if you did, please hit that thumbs up. If you missed the Elimination Chamber review, which is at 90,000 views right now, make sure you guys go and check it out. I'd love for it to be over 100,000. Follow me on Twitter at JD from NY206. And I'll see you guys tonight for SmackDown Live. What is John Cena going to do? We'll find out tonight on SmackDown Live. I'm JD. Hit that thumbs up, and I'll see you guys tonight for SmackDown Live Review. I'll talk to you later.